When you look for the word first in the Bible, you find this teaching. You go first to God with your problems. We don't take our problems first to the bar. We don't numb our fears with narcotics. We don't deny the existence of our struggles. No, we take our problems first to Christ. He said, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And look, all these things will be given to you as well. Would you like some advice to take into this year that will save you from a month of heartaches? Go first to God with your problems. The moment a problem surfaces is the moment you take that problem to God. Don't take it out on your friends. Don't take it out on your family. Don't try to solve it yourself. You take that problem first to God. Seek first the kingdom and see if all these things aren't given to you as well. Take it to Him first. You see, when God's people put God first, blessings begin to flow. I want to challenge you to let this be the year you put God first. Keep first things first, he promises, and then everything else will fall into place. Actively seek God's direction. In other words, God's strategies are better than ours. The prophet Isaiah said, his ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. God's strategies are always better, so I've got to seek him. I've got to ask him for direction, and how do I do that? I do that through prayer. Why? Because we don't want our plans to prevail. We want God's plans to prevail. We want God's wisdom in our life. That's why we seek Him. That's why I get up in the morning and pray and talk to God. What I need God's direction. I can't live life on my own impulses, my own strategies, my own gut instinct. No, I need the Spirit of God giving me wisdom. And that's something that can only come to pass through prayer. But here's what I've noticed. Many of us in the body of Christ, churches and Christians, we go to God with an already made up mind. Like we know what we're going to do and then we're just asking God to bless it. But God's saying, I wasn't in it to begin with. And you're asking me to bless something that I didn't ordain in your life. I didn't want you to make that choice. You made that choice. And I believe God wants to help you no matter what the situation is. But God's not here just to give to you. He wants to guide you. Not just give you things. He wants to guide you. In Psalm 32, it says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. How many of you are thankful that God has a best pathway for your life? But we have to seek His direction. Well, Josh, I don't know. I, I don't know how this all going to work out. Why don't you just read Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It says, trust God from the bottom of your heart. And don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do and everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. God will keep you on track. Don't plan first, and then when you're out in the middle of doing what you want to do, pray for God to make it work. No. First, we pray about everything, acknowledging God in all of our ways, and He will direct our path. But there are times in our lives where our actions aren't necessarily in obedience to what God's told us to do. Why? Because we want to do something else or what God's asking us to do doesn't feel good or what God's asking us to do doesn't align with our plans. Our actions are inconsistent with what we say that we believe. So what do we have to do? We got to get the right habits. Habits are powerful. They create our future. The habits that we live with and our actions that we do every day create the future that we're going to experience. Today, I would dare say that many of us are sitting in the middle of a life that we've created by our own habits, by our own actions. And when we're experiencing difficulty in life and when we're tired of it, it's then we got to say, you know what? I can't keep doing this thing anymore. It's bringing pain into my life and it's not working out. So what habits does God want to help you drop this year? What habits does he want to help to establish on the inside of you. You see, for some of you, I believe that God wants to help you establish a habit of prayer, a habit of prayer in your life where you start seeking God in the morning in a fresh way. You start knowing God's will for your life. Some of you, he just wants you to be faithful to come to his house more. Make church a priority in your life. And I know the kids' sports are important. I know that things come up. And I'm not saying that all that stuff is bad. But if you don't make parents, if you don't make church a priority in your kids' life, don't be surprised that when they move out of the house, it's not a priority to them. 
It takes faithful consistency in our actions to get breakthrough. I believe breakthrough people do consistently what other people just do occasionally. Most Christians I know who grow cold in their faith or who, who, who grow unproductive or unfruitful or unhappy in their lives do not do so out of a moment of rebellion, but do so as a result of minute by minute or day by day just drifting off course. The book of Hebrews, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it. Let the discipline of the first fruits recalibrate you every day, every week, so you can stay focused and you can stay on target. Now, one of the saddest scriptures in the Bible is Jeremiah 2.32. It says, my people have forgotten me days without number. But I love the NET translation of Jeremiah 2.32. Does a young woman forget to put on her jewels? Have you ever forgot your cell phone and went back home to get it? <laughs> Says, will a bride forget to put on her wedding dress? But my people have forgotten me for more days than can even be counted. We'll go back home if we forget our cell phone, but has anybody here ever forgotten to pray and thought, oh, I'm, I'm going back home to pray before I start this day? I'm suggesting that you no longer try to work God into your schedule, but you work your schedule around God. He would like to guide you and lead you through life. And literally, let me say it again, be involved in everything you do. In every decision you make, God wants to be part of it. Be patient. Be patient and wait. Don't give up. Don't give in. James 1 says, consider it a sheer gift when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced out into the open. And it shows its true colors. In other words, you really in it or not. It says, don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do it, its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. One translation says that you'll not lack anything. If I don't give up on God, then I know on the other side of my faithful obedience and patience that I'm going to be I'm going to be stronger than I've ever been. I'm going to be more mature than I've ever been. My marriage is going to be better than it's ever been. I'm going to have not be lacking anything that I need in my life if I don't throw in the towel and give up when times get hard. I'm going to trust God and God's going to bring a breakthrough. You know how you're going to get through the attack you're facing, friends? You know how you're going to get through the trials and the tribulation that you feel like you're facing today? You're only going to be able to get through it with God's help. Many years ago, God finally got this through to me, and He simply said this, you cannot do this. And by this, He meant life, ministry, whatever your this is. We're talking about your this. Rather, your this is raising four kids. Rather, your this is being a single parent. You cannot do this unless you put God first in your life. That means I can't do without Him. How do you keep going when times are tough? It's because you believe that your breakthrough is right around the corner. My breakthrough's on the way. I may not have it yet but I'm closer today than I was yesterday. Quit tying God's hands and take the limits off of it. Your situation is not too big for God. What you're dealing with, it's not like God haven't seen it before. He's done it before. He can do it again. There's no sickness that God haven't healed. There's not a soul that he can't deliver. There's not a marriage he can't put back together. But you got to trust him and take the limits off of it. Limits are something that bound or restrain or confine something or someone who cannot do something or have reached their limits. But I want to tell you that there is no limit in God. He's able to do whatever you need him to do. 
He knows that whatever your problem is, he knows the solution to your problem. The Bible says, Ephesians 3 and 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. You know, there is no limit in God. He's able to do whatever we need him to do. And know this, there's nothing too hard for God. But when you take the limit off of God, you will see miracles take place. If you trust him, take the limits off of him. Expect the great. Awesome things will happen in your life. God don't give you what you want. He give you what you believe. See, the how-to is none of your business. You keep getting in the way of the blessing because you all up in the how-to part of it. Show me the scripture where he tells you to figure out how to do anything. He don't ask you to how-to nothing. You just need the word. You need to know what it's saying applied to you. You know why? Because it's a promise of his. He never lied. He always come through. Psalm 78 verse 41, he says, yes, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited the Holy One of Israel. Now, how is it possible that we can limit God? Isn't God limitless? Isn't God bigger than than we ever could think or imagine? Doesn't he want to do exceeding abundantly above it all above and beyond all that we can ask or think? Anybody got an answer to that? Absolutely. He's bigger than all that. But yet they limited him. But we do put limits on God. Sometimes in our mind, we have a version of what God is capable of. We have a version of what God is like. We have a version of what Jesus is like. We got to get rid of a small God. We got to let go of a small Jesus. We got to stop worshiping a small savior. He is the conquering king. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is bigger than you ever imagined. He is greater than you ever imagined. God is able to do so many things, but we limit him. We limit him because of what we hear other people say. We limit him because of a human natural experience. We limit the Holy One of Israel. God is unlimited. Amen. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus came into the house. The blind man came to him and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Do you believe? Now, I didn't say, do you believe you can see? But do you believe, Jesus said, do you believe that I am able to do this? Our faith is not in our faith. Our faith is in Him. It is not your faith. It is who you have your faith in. A lot of times people are limiting their own lives in what they say about themselves. Being down on yourself. Feeling like you're not good enough. Like you're less than. And this voice can come to us in a lot of different ways. The world is going to tell you what you can't do. Satan is going to tell you what you can't do. You don't also need to be in agreement with those voices. Instead, you need to agree with what God says about you. If God approves you, then approve yourself. If God chose you, then choose yourself. If God believes in you, then you should believe in yourself. We got to learn to stop the negative voices and start to recognize I'm still a work in progress. So often we look at the mess and we don't look at the progress. David had a different kind of voice. He said this in Psalms uh, chapter 18 and verse 29, because of God, I can run through a troop. Because of my helper, the Lord, I can leap over a wall. You see, because of God, I can. Do you see that? We need to take on that same, uh, that same kind of phrasing in our life, that same kind of belief system. Because of God, I can, not I can't, I'll never be enough. I'm not smart enough. I got rejected. I had a bad start, pastor. No, David didn't do that. David said, because of God, I can. You know, people are going to say stuff about you to try and limit you, but don't limit yourself. You got enough against you for you to be against yourself. If God is for you, then why would you want to be against yourself? Take off the limits of what other people try and put on you. They said you can't do it, but that doesn't mean that you can't do it. They didn't create you. See, God will take the unique things about you 
and use them to promote you and elevate you. Sometimes the same thing you don't like about yourself is the same thing God wants to use to show you greatness and promotion. What's our job? To stop being mad about ourselves and putting ourselves down. Stop being so hard on ourselves. Quit telling yourself all the reasons you can't accomplish your dreams, what you don't have, what you didn't get. It's not going to happen just by your ability, your talent, your connections. It's going to happen by the Spirit of the living God. He's breathing on your life right now. His favor is surrounding you in a greater way. There are breakthroughs already in route. Healing, promotions, contracts, the right people, they're already headed your way. Now don't talk yourself out of it. Receive the blessing. Now take the limits off of God and take the limits off of yourself. Most people have kind of a fatalistic theology that things just happen and it's fatalistic and it, you, there's nothing you can do about it. And that is absolutely untrue. God has a perfect plan for every person's life in here. And God has good thoughts for you. His plans for your life are awesome. He never made a piece of junk. He never made a dud. He never made an average person. Every one of us have something special that God wants to accomplish. But most people are ignorant of this and they have bought into the lie of this world that there's nothing special about them. Every one of you are special. Every one of you are unique. Every one of you can do something that nobody else can do. God has a purpose for your life and most people are limiting what God can do because they just aren't challenging themselves. God made you for something great. God has taken ordinary people, what the world calls ordinary people, and time after time after time after time after time has just transformed their life and then used them to touch other people and change things. But when you put God first, I guarantee you, He will transform your life. While I wait, God works. This is not a, a, a nice little Christian sentiment to get you through a hard season. This is anchored in the unchanging word of God. He promises us, if you wait on me, I'll work for you. If you wait on me, if you're patient, if you have expectation, if you don't give up, if you don't cash out, if you just keep following me, I promise you, you may not see what I'm doing. You may even be tempted to think I'm not doing anything at all, but all the while I'm orchestrating things for my glory and for your good. God works while we wait. Even when I don't see it and even when I don't feel it, you're working. So grab hold of that and cling to that truth. It doesn't mean your circumstances change in a minute. It doesn't mean you're gonna wake up tomorrow to a, to a bed full of roses. It just means that while you wait, heaven works. God's always working. No matter what the crossroads you're at in life, when you are forced to face the trials and tribulations of life, when you are at the point not knowing what to do or where to turn, you can trust in God. Every one of us go through valley experiences. Every one of us are faced with these valleys. These are part of the experience of life. But every time we go through these valleys, we need to know that He's there. God may not, He may not do what you think, he may do the total opposite of what you think, but he's still going to do something. So many times we think, God, what have you done? Why have you left me out? No, man. Apathy's not in that brother's vocabulary. And he ain't never late. He made time. He is time. He has infinite wisdom. He has all the information that could ever be known. He's the alpha, the scripture says, in the omega. So he stands at the end and makes decisions about now, where we stand in the now and go, with all the information we have, we don't know why, God, you're not doing this. And God's going, oh, that's because you don't have all the information yet. There's a lot of things you don't understand yet. And I'm navigating all those pieces to make sure what we do isn't fast, but it's right and is good and is noble. Lamentations 3.25 says this, The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the person who seeks after 
him. You have to know today that we are serving a God who is other than us. It's not a better version of you, bigger version of you, cleaner version of you. His ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts is what Isaiah says. So when you can't hear his voice speaking, trust that his hands are working. Trust God's timing while you wait. Trust God's timing while you wait. There's a reason for your delay. See, there's a reason for every season that we go through. And if we'll not get bitter and upset, we'll start to trust God in the middle of the season. See, I like A and I like Z. I'm not a big fan of LMNOP. I'm not a big fan of the middle. I like the beginning and the end. But God says, if you'll trust me from L to M to N to O to P, I'll take you to Z. And you'll be grateful because what I'm doing in you is more important than where you're going to. What I'm going to do in you is more important than what I'll do through you. I've got to do something in you at G H I J K before you get to Z. You think you're ready for the blessing, but I'm still preparing you. I'm still working in you. It's a process. Trust God's timing. He's got a plan for you. He's got a plan for your life in the season that you're in. No, no matter how big your problems are, if, if you can spend time in the presence of God and you know that he's walking with you, it overrides everything else that's going on in your life because you just know that he's going to take care of it some way, somehow. You just make sure that you stay in faith that you keep believing and let me work. As long as you're believing, God is working. And I'll tell you what we need to be saying more of, and I've, I've, I've been doing this for a good number of years, and it's really, really helpful. When I'm waiting on something, and then I start to think about how long it's been, and you know, my mind starts to go negative, I say out loud, God is working. God is working and it helps me because he is. You know, when you get a breakthrough, God didn't start just working on that a second before you got it. God's working in your life right now. He's heard your prayers. He's working in your situation. But especially when you've prayed prayers for other people, you have no control over how long it takes them to listen to God. You work hard and you've believed God and You've been waiting what seems like forever for that kid to change or for your finances to change or for you to change or, or whatever. But I'm here to tell you I've been there, done that, still go through it in different seasons at different times. And I am telling you by the word of God and from my, my experience and the experience of many others that God is faithful and I don't know how long you will have to wait, but I do know that God will come through. And I do know that you can enjoy your wait if you will just improve your attitude. How we wait is possibly more important than what we're waiting for. If we're gonna spend all this time waiting, why not wait with the right attitude. Why not live our best days even while we're waiting for the destination? You don't have to wait till you get to the destination to live out your best days. You can start living out your best days even while you're waiting. That's what God wants for us. And I feel like God has this, this thought with us. He says, listen, there's a right way to wait and there's a wrong way to wait. Some people wait with impatience. They wait with anger, frustration, twiddling their thumbs. When are you going to be ready? When are we going to get there? Are we there yet? Uh, uh, some people wait with anger. Why have, why have I not reached to where I want to be? Why have we not sold the house yet? Why, why haven't we moved into a house? And sometimes we can get tired while we're waiting on the next season of life. And hope begins to wane in the waiting, doesn't it? Because you begin to think, okay, well, maybe tomorrow's going to be the day. Well, after so many, maybe tomorrow's going to be the day. The enemy begins to have a playground with your mind and go, no, yesterday wasn't the day and tomorrow's not going to be the day. I'm waiting here. We as a people don't like to wait. So at the end of the day, what do you do when you feel like his voice is silent? We trust that his hands are active. His ability to work 
does not hinge on my perception of him working. He is God Almighty and paints on a bigger canvas than I can imagine. This is who he is. He's never missed a call. He's never done something he wished he could take back. He's never been so busy figuring out something that he missed you over here while you were doing your thing. Never one time has God failed. And today won't be the day he starts and you won't be the person that he starts with. This is the hope. But remember, what is hope? It's a positive expectation that something good is going to happen to me. To have hope and expectancy is the Hebrew translation for the word wait. So he's not saying just wait like, you know, maybe this is going to happen or I kind of like throw, you know, throw a coin in a wishing well. I hope this, I wish this would happen. No, he says, wait with an expectant heart that God's going to bring this to pass. Wait with great expectations. And this is what Isaiah says. He says, if you'll wait upon the Lord and you'll wait the right way, he will renew your strength. You will mount up with wings like eagles. You will run and not be weary. You will walk and not faint. That's God's promise to us that if we wait the right way, we're not going to get burned out. We're not going to get exhausted. We're not going to get impatient and settle for something less than what God has promised us to wait on. We're going to be able to hold steady in the middle of our waiting and not fall off, not quit church, not quit believing in God, not give up on the promises. Sometimes when we're waiting for a promise, it's easy to get exhausted while we're waiting. It's easy to get impatient, to feel burned out, to just say, you know what? whatever. I'm not going to church. I'm not going to believe it. I'm going to stop reading my Bible. When the promise comes to pass, then I'll believe that God's for me. We've got to learn how to wait with expectancy that even while we're waiting for the promise to come to pass, God's with me. He's for me. He's working behind scenes. It will happen. God, I'm believing that my best days are not behind me. Lord, I'm believing the promise will come to pass. What's in front of me is going to be greater than what's behind me. Lord, what you're doing in me is greater than what is happening to me. Lord, I'm standing on your promises. I will not quit. I will not give up. I'm expecting a harvest in Jesus' name. God's saying, it's time for you to wait with great expectations. This season is important. Don't get bitter while you're waiting for the promises of God to come to pass. While you're waiting for that family member to get back to church. While you're waiting for that, that loved one to give his life back to Jesus. While you're waiting for a house to sell. While you're waiting to, to, to do that next season, direction from God. Whatever you're waiting on, God says, wait with great expectations. Put your hope in the Lord. James chapter 5 verse 7 says that we're called to wait like a farmer waits for the harvest. A farmer is confident. He's not stressed out. He's not worried. I don't know if the harvest is going to come. No, he knows harvest is on the way. I've done my work. I've planted. I've done all the watering. It's just a matter of time before the harvest gets here. See, we're called to wait with that kind of confidence. God, the promise is coming to pass. What I've been praying for, Lord, I've been sowing the seeds. Lord, I'm expecting the harvest is on the way. Let me ask you a question. When are you going to start thanking God for the miracle in your life? You know that thing you've always wanted to happen? That prayer you've always been praying, that dream you've always had? When are you going to start thanking God for it? You say, well, after it happens. When you thank God after something happens, that's called gratitude. When you thank God for something before it happens, that's called faith. The highest form of faith is thanking God in advance before you get the answer. But while you make the request, what do you do while you're waiting? You thank God. You say, God, you know that request I made the other day? I thank you that the answer is already on its way. It's not here yet, but I thank you that the answer is already on its way. And you just keep thanking and thanking. That is the highest form of faith. You don't keep saying, please give it, please give it, please give it, please give it, please give it. You say, God, here's what I need. Now, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That is faith, thanking God in advance. Say thank you in advance for what's already yours. It's how I live my life. That's why I, why I am, one of the reasons why I am today. Say thank you in advance for what is already yours. True desire in the heart 
for anything good is God's proof to you sent beforehand to indicate that it's yours already. I'll say it again. True desire in the heart, that itch that you have, whatever it is you want to do, that desire, that itch, that's God's proof to you sent beforehand already to indicate that it's yours. Uh, Jesus said this in Mark chapter 11. Anytime you ask for anything in prayer, believe that you have received it and you will receive it. Now, I really want you to get this. Notice the change in tense here. Believe that you have received it. That's past tense. And you will receive it. That's future tense. You say, wait a minute. I've got to believe I've got it in order to get it? Yep. That's called faith. I believe that I've got it already in order to get it. You say, you mean I've got to believe a thing is so even though it isn't so, so that it will become so? Yes. That's called faith. We all have dreams and goals that God's placed in our heart, things we're believing for, situations we're praying to turn around. These promises start off like seeds. They don't come to pass overnight. There's always a period of waiting involved. And from the time we pray till the time we see it come to fulfillment, that's called the trial of our faith. This is when many people get discouraged and give up. They start believing the negative thoughts. It's never going to happen. It's taken too long. Now that seed is lying dormant. It's still alive. It still has potential, but you have to do your part and start watering the seed. The way you water it is by thanking God in advance. You can't wait till you receive the promise. You have to thank God that the answer is on the way. Maybe you're struggling in your health. The medical report doesn't look good. Don't talk about how you feel. Say, Father, thank you that I'm healthy. Thank you that I'm strong. Thank you with long life you're satisfying me. That's not just being positive. That's watering the seed. In your finances, maybe you're struggling. Business is slow. All through the day, Father, thank you that whatever I touch prospers and succeeds. Thank you that I'm coming out of debt. Thank you that your favor surrounds me like a shield. When you thank God in advance for the answer, it not only waters the seed, but that strengthens your own faith. So often we think, I'll give God praise after the problem turns around. I'll thank God after business picks up, after I see the solution. Now, if you don't learn this principle to thank God in advance, you won't have the strength you need to wait for the promise. What keeps us strong is getting up in the morning saying, Father, thank you that my dreams are coming to pass. Thank you that this problem's turning around. Thank you that you're bigger than this obstacle. Giving thanks to God removes the anxiety. You can be anxious and worried about anything. You start thanking Him, praising Him, focusing on Him, and it is amazing how the anxiety disappears. Next thing you know, you think, well, you know, what am I worried about? I've got holy, almighty, sovereign God on my side taking care of me. Why am I down in the dumps? Listen, living in the dumps isn't God's plan, and He can get you out real fast. You start thanking Him and praising Him, the devil runs, and God gets you out, and you're rejoicing and praising the Lord before you know it. Because anxiety and fretting over things is not the will of God. We're thanking God before the battle. We're thanking God in advance. That's verbalized faith. Thank you, God, you're taking care of my bankruptcy. Thank you, God, you're taking care of my pain. Thank you, God, you're taking care of this conflict. Thank you, God, and I'm thanking God in advance. Once you pray and ask God to bring the promise to pass, you ask God to heal you, you ask Him to restore a relationship, from then on, you don't need to ask God one more time. He heard you the very first time. Now, every time you think about it, you should thank God that the answer is on the way. One time Daniel prayed and asked God to help him. Day after day went by, nothing got better. It looked like that God didn't even hear his prayer. But on the 21st day, an angel showed up and said, Daniel, the first day you prayed, God heard you 
and dispatch me with the answer. But it took me 21 days to fight through the forces of darkness. What I want you to see is the first day you prayed, God heard you. The first time you asked, God set the miracle into motion. The very first day, the answer was on the way. That's why you don't have to keep praying about the same thing, begging God, asking again and again. The answer is already on the way. The promise is already in motion. The breakthrough is already in route. The right person is already in your future. The victory is already up ahead of you. You prayed about it, now switch over into praise. Start thanking God that is coming. Start thanking Him in advance for the healing, the restoration, the promotion, the vindication, the dream. It's headed your way. You only need to ask God for it one time, but then in all your future prayers, you thank Him. Does that make sense? So you don't have to keep going, please give it to me, please give it to me, please give it to me, please, like you're begging God. No, you just have to say, God, I want you to give this to me. And then for the rest of the time until it arrives, you just thank God. That's faith. Some of you have prayed about the situation long enough. You got to switch over into praise. Get up every morning. Father, thank you that my dreams are coming to pass. Thank you that healing is coming. Thank you that promotion is on its way. That's what's going to keep you strong, not begging, not praying again and again. No, remember, like Daniel, the first day you prayed, God heard it and set the miracle into motion. It's already on the way. As you keep giving God praise, He's going to keep giving you strength to believe. When are you going to start thanking God for that breakthrough in your life? You've wanted it all your life but you haven't been thanking God for it in advance. You've just been begging like you have to bargain or bribe or pressure God to say yes. God wants to say yes. He's waiting for you to show faith. When are you gonna thank God in advance? When are you gonna put the choir before the army in your life? Right now, that many of you listening to me are just barely holding on. It's been a rough year and I wanna tell you don't give up. Don't, 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 don't you dare give up. Hold on. This too shall pass. The tough stuff that you're going through, it didn't come to stay. It came to pass. It's not going to last. The problem's not gonna last. So don't give up on God. Don't give up on your marriage. Don't give up on your church. Don't give up on your dream. Don't give up. Don't give up. Look up. Look up. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who created you, who thought you up, who loves you, who has a purpose for your life, who died on the cross for you, who rose again, and is coming back one day, who's going to take you to heaven one day. Jesus Christ is the secret of strength to make it to the end of your marathon and end well. When we go through a bad season of life, those circumstances that are oppressing us, they're very real. But there's another reality. And that reality that God is in the heavens and he is controlling and watching and all powerful over every circumstance in our life. We have a choice. Are we going to focus on our circumstances or are we going to focus on our God? Things will start looking up when you start looking up. In other words, your circumstances will improve when you stop looking at them and start looking to God. Let me say it again. Things start looking up when I start looking up. You know, in the Bible, there's a phrase that's used over and over and over, and it is the phrase, lift up your eyes. It's said many, many times in Scripture, it's just one way of saying, look up. Get your eyes off yourself and off your problems and off your circumstances and onto God. Refocus, look at Him. Things will start looking up when I start looking up. When we look up and we see how big God is, it, it naturally shrinks the size of our problems. They just don't seem to be as big or as overwhelming when compared to the greatness of God. I don't know what burdens you're bearing. 
I don't know what grief or fear or anxiety or confusion you may be feeling right now, but I do know this. You need to look up instead of giving up. Don't give up, look up. In your disillusioned heart, in your angst, you've got your eyes focused on the wrong place. Until your eyes are fixed on the Lord, you won't be able to endure the days that go from bad to worse. That's the key. Until your eyes are fixed on the Lord, you won't be able to endure the days that go from bad to worse. The Bible invites us over and over and over, fix your eyes on me, God says, fix your eyes on me. Fix your eyes on me. Hebrews calls us, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Are you in the middle of a, of a discouraging season? Fix your eyes, friends. Fix your eyes back on Jesus. In a, in a season of emotional pain, fix your eyes on Jesus. Do it once, do it twice, do it multiple times a day. Do it constantly throughout the day. Remember and rehearse who he is. Remember who he is. Remember what he's promised to do. So when your schedules press, when your prospects thin, when your hope burns low, when people disappoint you, when events turn against you, when dreams die, when the walls close in, when the prognosis is grim, when your heart breaks. Because when life is crushing, we don't have anywhere else to go. Because of who he is, he will always do what is best for you. Now, sometimes we have to talk ourselves off the ledge. We have to remind ourselves of important truths like God knows what he's doing. He doesn't make mistakes. His timing is always perfect. Whatever is happening, he is choosing to allow for this moment. It's challenging to trust and keep trusting, but we have to because he is who he said he is and he will do what he says he'll do. This is the difference between ordinary people and great people. Great people never give up. They never give up. They keep on in the marathon of life, even when they're fatigued, even when they're frustrated, even when they feel like failures, and even when they're fearful. Don't you dare, friend, give in without a fight. Fight back. Fight back against your discouragement. Fight back against the devil. Fight back against those who want to discourage you. You got a great dream and at some point, the devil whispers in your, who do you think you are attempting to do this? Wrong question. You should build your life not on what you think you can do, but what you think God can do. You let the size of your God determine the size of your goal. It's not about, do you think I would have tried to do all things I've tried to do in life because I was depending on me? Not a chance. In my flesh there dwelleth no good thing. I, I know that I can't do certain things. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So that's pretty clear. Now, how do you react when your plans take longer than expected? When what you thought was gonna take be done real quickly, when you have a project and you go, man, this is taking me a long time to get through school. This is taking me a long time to get this thing built. This is taking me, what do you do? Do you give in to self-pity? Do you start complaining? You start blaming other people? Friends, if at first you don't succeed, you're normal. You're normal, okay? Nobody succeeds at first. The only way you actually succeed in life is by failing a bunch and learning what doesn't work. Failure is the stepping stone to success. Nobody ever succeeds without having failures. 
Success, here's the difference between successful and unsuccessful people. Successful people see failure as a temporary setback. Unsuccessful people see it as a mark on their character. Well, I'm a failure. No, no, nobody succeeds at everything. Nobody has an unbroken record of success. Refocus on God. Stop listening to the negativity and resist the discouragement. Don't you give into it. Resist it. Fight it. And who will give you the energy to fight it? Your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So focus on him, not on the problem. When we're at our worst, God's at his best. The stage is now set for God to work his will his way. You see, over and over again in the scriptures, over and over again, the stage is set for God to do his most amazing work when the situation looks the bleakest to us. When you and I are fresh out of options, when you and I are fresh uh, 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 at, the, at the end of our rope, when you and I are at the end of ourselves and we're full of fear and we're full of uncertainty, that's when God steps back, rolls up his sleeves and starts to wow us again. The challenge for us is not giving up too soon. You know, a lot of people start off great in life. But even before they get to the halfway point in their life, they've already really messed it up and they've given up, which is worse than messing up. Let me say it again. Giving up is always worse than messing up. Everybody messes up. Why do people give up in the marathon of their lives? Because they got discouraged. Choose to change the channel of your mind. Don't keep replaying all those discouraging images in your mind. Instead, remember the Lord. Choose to think about God and what he, his faithfulness, his love, his mercy, his compassion. Choose to think about God because your thoughts always determine your feelings. Do you want to stop being discouraged? Then stop thinking the way you've been thinking. You know, when bad days come into our lives, we want God to do something big, something miraculous, don't we? nor miraculous cure to the illness, the immediate return of a prodigal, the overnight breaking of a destructive addiction, the erasure of the financial problems we're suffering. We want God to act dramatically and instantaneously. Sometimes he does that, but usually that's not how it works. It's not in the big things. Instead, it's in that still small voice that God comes to give us courage to face that illness or the grace to accept that prodigal's departure from God. The ability, the wisdom to handle the financial difficulty we're experiencing, that's how God speaks most often. And when the waves are crashing and the winds are howling around us, it is important that we learn how to listen to God's real but sometimes small voice in the midst of our bad season of life. Bad days are inevitable, but they don't have to be paralyzing. Those who live a significant life learn to expect bad days and learn how to refresh themselves physically, emotionally, and spiritually. You know, I found that going through a bad season of life is a lot like traveling through a dark tunnel. The bad news is in that tunnel, it is dark. You can't see in front of you. You don't know if you'll ever make it out. But the good news is once you've entered into that dark tunnel, with God's help, you're already on the way out. All of us run out of hope at some point. Am I right or wrong? I think all of us do. Even that cup is half full sanguine soul who always goes around singing the sun will come up tomorrow even that person on occasion will reach up into the shelf for a can of hope and find there is no hope 
Maybe that's where you are today. Maybe you're here more out of desperation than inspiration. Is there any hope? Are you asking that question? You're running out of hope. Are you the single mom who's running out of hope? Are you the elderly person who has buried someone you love and your hope has left you? Are you the businessman who looks professional on the inside, but it's been a long time since you had a good night's sleep and you can't find peace? Are you running out of hope? Are you feeling like giving up? Are you close to despair? Don't do it. Don't. The blackest moments we live through will last only a little time. It's pretty easy sometimes to to feel beaten. That doesn't mean give up. In fact, it means the opposite. It means it's time for you to fight harder. And I'm going to tell you right now, it won't be easy. It will be hard because life is hard. That's what life is. And these challenges, these challenges that you face, they're going to do their best to take you down. Do not let them. Stand up. Dig in. Line up those problems and confront them. Face them. Fight them. Do not let them bring you down. In fact, in fact, let those challenges raise you up. Let them elevate you. Let their demands and their trials make you stronger. Let the adversity you face today turn you into a better person tomorrow. So, So in the future, you look back at these struggles and you say to them, thank you. You made me better. You cannot keep a person down who won't stay down. It's one thing to be knocked down, but the problem is you won't stay down. There are already witnesses in this room who would testify. It's not that I haven't been knocked down, but God keeps giving me the strength, the energy, the wherewithal, the anointing, the power, to not stay down that every time something or somebody knocks me down God keeps raising me back see ladies and gentlemen life is not about not getting knocked down life is about not staying down you can't quit you come too far to quit now. Today I refuse to quit. Today I refuse to give up. I've come too far to look back now. Amen. Has anyone else came too far to look back again? We have come too far. God has been far too good. I refuse to quit. No matter what's going on in our world today, No matter what is going on in my temptations today, no matter what's going on in my family, with my friends, at my job, in my health, I refuse to quit. I'm not going to give up. Your situation may have changed. Your circumstances may have changed. It may feel like it's bigger. It may feel like it's greater. 
But friend, today our God has not changed. He will never change. The same God that helped you back then, the same God that was with you in the beginning, the same God that showed himself strong in your situation before is with you right now. Don't get this far down the road and turn around. Don't come this far. Don't overcome all those challenges and addictions and trials and what the world has thrown at you. And then at this point in your life, turn around. It's not worth it. Someone needs to hear this. You're facing challenges. You're facing addictions. You're facing that affliction, that temptation. You need to refuse to quit. You need to refuse to give up today. Some of you need to remember the history of victory that God has in your life. Do you remember all of those times where you said, I'm not going to make it through this? And look where you're at today. I remember some of the darkest times of my life. I would lay on the bed in tears. I would lay on the bed sometimes without even words to pray. And Satan would whisper and say, this is it. This is the big one. This is the last time you'll ever have to go through this because your life's going to be ending or this is going to ruin your entire life. But guess what? Here I stand today. But by the grace of God, he delivered me time and time again. And even when it seemed tough, even when it seemed rough, my God was faithful. But see, for some reason, we go through a new storm, we go through a new trial, and we tend to forget all of the past. And all of the times that God delivered us. Church, today you need to remind yourself of the goodness of God. There were things in my life that should have taken me out. There were things in my life where I was going the wrong direction. There were afflictions in my life that should have killed me. But by the grace of God, here I am today. And you have the same story today, church. I want to encourage you. There's been things in your life that should have taken you out. But here you sit today, breathing, alive, able to see, able to talk, able to walk. Because of the grace of God. That's something to get excited about today. We have a history of victory. If God says you can make it, guess what? You can make it. And you will make it. No matter how negative it looks today, you're going to come back. It's time to get up off the mat. If you've been knocked down, if you've been through something, if you've been through financial setback or some kind of terrible thing has hit you in your health or, or something's happened to your family, we need to believe that it's time for a comeback. It's no time to quit. It's no time to give up. It's no time to moan and groan. We may be down, but we're not out because we serve a comeback God. And I want you to know the attitude of our God is I'm not going to give up on anybody. I'm preaching to some people who have fallen behind. And the enemy is whispering to you, give up. The devil wants you to think it's gone forever. Whatever it is that he stole from you, it's gone forever. But it is not gone forever because God is planning you a comeback. That if there's breath in our lungs, he's not finished with us yet. No matter how old you are, no matter how bad you've missed it, no matter how bad things look, don't worry, God's not finished yet. If you haven't seen the breakthrough, God's not finished yet. If you haven't seen the miracle, if things haven't turned around for the good, don't worry. God's not finished. See, God's not setting us up to leave us halfway finished. He's not setting us up to not finish what he started. No, he wants to bring us to a flourishing finish, which means that our best days are right in front of us. Some of us in this room, maybe we've had failed businesses, failed marriages. Maybe we've made some bad mistakes and we think to ourselves, God's done with me. God can't use me. He's not going to use me in ministry again. He's not going to give me another business. I declare bankruptcy. You need to stop accepting those self-limiting beliefs, those self-limiting lies, those God-limiting lies. We serve a God who's never finished when there's breath in our lungs. God can turn things around. He can get you on the right track. And I think many of us in this room have accepted limits that God didn't put on us, we put on ourselves. We've accepted caps that other people have said over this, you can't do that, 
You're too young. You're too old. God's done with you. You messed up. You screwed up. You, you missed it. You'll never get out of this. We've got to break those limitations off. Because we've accepted that we can't, we won't. And because we won't, we'll never realize that we actually can. Today is the day to stir up that hunger to say, with God, all things are possible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me.